I welcome you to the 2021 Franciscan Zoom Lectures, hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology. Robert W. McElroy is the Bishop of San Diego. During his 34 years as a priest of the Archdiocese of San Francisco, he received a doctorate in moral theology from the Gregorian University in Rome and a doctorate in political science from Stanford. He served as a delegate to the Amazon Synod and was recently appointed by Pope Francis as a member of the Dicastery on Integral Human Development. I welcome Bishop McElroy. It's wonderful to be with all of you uh, tonight as we reflect on uh, Fratelli Tutti. And uh, I particularly want to thank all of you who are connected to FST. Uh, as you may know, um, FST uh, provides the uh, seminary instruction for our seminarians in their theology program and also is has been, of course, a great beacon in the diocese as a whole. So I'm very grateful to be here with you tonight. I'm very grateful for so, all that you have, so many of you have done as members of the FST community. When I was in college, uh, I was taught by a man named Michael Walzer, who was an eminent uh, uh, ethical uh, writer and a philosopher. And he presented a theory of justice, which is very common and makes a lot of sense. And he called it spheres of justice. And what he said is that all of us live in different spheres of justice and different people have moral claims on us. Basically, calibrated to the relationship we have with them. That is moral claims were not so universal. It was rather that to members of our family, we owe a higher moral duty than we do to strangers. And to people with whom we work, to people in our neighborhoods, to all the different relations that we have, those relationships produce mutual moral obligations that we have. And thus our responsibilities morally correspond to that level of uh, relationship. And uh, he wouldn't have argued that that was entirely true. We have universal obligations, but the primary prism through which he urged us to see, Michael Walls urged us to see our moral responsibilities was that of relationships, that as we go through this pilgrimage of life on this earth, we generate webs of relationships in which we are tied to one another in a way that is morally important and morally defining. Now, what Pope Francis is doing is quite different. Pope Francis in Fratelli Tutti starts out with an entirely different objective. He doesn't deny that there are higher levels of obligation to members of our family, you know, to, to spouses to one, one another, to, the, to their children, to their parents, all these different relations exist, and that those have a high level of commitment and responsibility that we have because those relations. He doesn't deny that. He does something quite different though and is rooted in Francis of Assisi. What Pope Francis is about in this encyclical is saying that we must reconstruct our approach to the whole question of what are our obligations from those who by the lights of the world are most distant from us. And to understand that those are webs of moral obligation and moral meaning also. Uh, he, he takes the title of the, and the first words of the uh, encyclical from, uh, from St. Francis of Assisi, who's gathering around the members of the Franciscan community in an early stage and talking to them about the fact that their love for one another and ultimately their love for every human being. And of course with Francis of Assisi, you're dealing with all creature, but shatters time and distance. 
he says that we have to rethink our relationship with others and particularly our relationship to the stranger, those who live in other lands, those who are of other races, those who have literally no specific human ties to us other than our humanity itself. And he calls this, Pope Francis calls this social friendship. He wants to create a way of understanding what does it mean to live in the world and help create a world and uh, recreate the world so that it is filled with social friendship. And uh, he's dealing with the moral complexity of our lives. And the entry point, the, the part of the, the incident that I consider most powerful is his use of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, and he goes through the parable and he speaks of each of the characters and then applies all of them to us. He says, quote, all of us have in ourselves something of the wounded man, something of the robber, something of the priest and the Levite, and something of the Samaritan. And then he begins his explanation of the parable. The Samaritan is the man filled with an utter zeal and willingness to sacrifice for others. He's like St. Francis in many ways. Um, you know, one of the problems is that we hear these parables so often, we take for granted what they mean. But we need to listen to the parable of the Good Samaritan with new ears, really. Uh, because scripture scholars tell us that the place where the Samaritan was traveling, where the priest and the Levite were traveling, where the, the, the victim was traveling and got robbed, was a dangerous place. We think of the action of the Good Samaritan as being the action of a good and kind man. It is that but it's something far more powerful. When the Samaritan comes along and looks and sees the victim lying by the road, the wounded person, he doesn't know whether that wounded person has truly been victimized, whether he's bait and the robbers are still around, whether maybe he's not bait, but the robbers are still around and that's if the Samaritan goes over to help him, he'll be, he'll be beaten too. He doesn't know those things. So for him, it's a risky action. He literally takes his life and well-being into his hands. And he does so, and then he follows through on it. This is not a mere act of kindness. We, we usually think of it, oh, he was a good and kind man, and he wasn't so restricted in whom he shared that kindness with. He shared outside his group, the Samaritans. Now, this is something much more powerful. His love was a love that was, in a very real way, willing to risk all to help an utter stranger, a stranger in every meaning of the word in the society in which he lived. That's the type of social friendship that Pope Francis talks about. He says that must be part of our lives. The Pope says in, in the, uh, in the he says, the, um, the Levite and the priest, uh, as they were going by, they probably were not bad men or even morally weak men, but they didn't have that kind of love to risk in that way. They looked over, they saw it, and they thought, as I confess, I have on many occasions, I'm passing by this one, you know, uh, and uh, because this is a very risky situation. So, the Pope says the figures of the Levite and uh, the priest have two functions. One is 
to show us what passing by in this world means. It's our natural inclination. And this doesn't mean just passing by people who are victimized by robbers. It means when we come across situations of enormous suffering in our world and uh, we pass them by because it's easier not to, not to get involved, not to help. The victim is the wounded person just lying there. We don't know whether he's dead at that point. And we don't know what his history is, how he came to be by the side of the road. And the Samaritan goes over to him and embraces him. That's the social friendship that the Pope is speaking to. That is it at work, doing away with all those boundaries of family ties, religious ties, uh, nationality, all of this, and simply seeing the human need before him. And the, Francis the Pope says that we must be like that. The robbers, of course, are lurking in the side and we don't really see them. But the Pope in his encyclical says, that each of us, to reflect upon this parable well, each of us has to understand that there is, as I said, a part of the robber, a part of the Good Samaritan, a part of the victim, a part of the Levite and the priest in all of us. The Samaritan is for those moments when we really do take a risk out of love and usually out of love that is not demanded or necessary but of love which is freely given in a difficult situation that's when we are good samaritan and part of us is levite and priest passing by in all of our lives we turn away partly because we don't want to face the suffering and partly we don't want to face ourselves in understanding that we are purposely saying no to a human being lying before us. And that the robbers, at times all of us participate in the darkness of this world. At times all of us choose pathways which victimize other people in a variety of ways. And thus we are the robbers also. And we are victims, each of us in our lives have moments when we feel just tossed by the side of the road, in which we are wounded and suffering and no one seems to take notice. I was in a discussion group about a month ago uh, on this question and one of the uh, participants said, well, the Pope left out the innkeeper and it was a brilliant thought because uh, the innkeeper is the one who took care of the man, the victim, the wounded man, the suffering man. It is the innkeeper who helped heal his wounds and saw to his feeding him and giving him a place. And really, after that uh, participant said this, uh, I, I thought, you know, really most of us, for most of our lives when we're doing good things, we're more like the innkeeper. It's not that we're taking a big risk. That does come to us in life. And the, the power of the Good Samaritan does have that striking demand on us that at times in our lives, we must risk out of love for others who have no claim on us. But also, the innkeeper is the one who does good and so much good for this person who's been wounded and is suffering. And most of us in our lives help in the various ministries in the church and structures that exist and in our personal ways of helping other people, again, who have no claim on this because this social love that, that, that Francis, Pope Francis is talking about this, 
is not done because people have a claim on us. It is done because in their humanity and in their suffering, we respond to it. And the Pope is really trying to help us to think in a wholly different way about how we approach helping others and how we look upon ourselves. So having reflected upon that, the Pope says that as a matter of fact, our challenge is to make distance. And by that he means, you know, different economic statuses, different religious statuses, different national statuses, um, di uh, all of the differences of race that are troubling our country so deeply. To, to put those aside insofar as they are usually seen as boundaries or limits to what we are obligated to do as followers of Jesus Christ. This is a wholly different way of loving. I mean, it is the way Christ loved. It is the way St. Francis loved. That's why St. Francis was able to go, uh, go and visit those who were perceived as enemies and make them into friends because he was filled with that kind of love. But we are each asked in our own life to ask how we allow various structures uh, to limit us. Uh, during World War II, there was a, a man named Lucien Burnell. He was a Carmelite. And he was the headmaster of a school outside of Paris. And he resolved, it was a boys boarding school. And many of the parents of the children of the school had fled friends. And so the, the children had no one to go home to if anything happened at the school. And it was in a small town and uh, the headmaster, Lucien Bernal, was constantly getting into antagonistic fights with the Nazi commandant of the town because the commandant wanted to shut the school down. It was the only center of independence in the whole of that, that village. And uh, so they'd go back and forth. And Brunel was a very uh, bright and capable man. So he's always able to find ways of outwitting the headmaster to keep the school open. And then in 1943, uh, just when he thought everything was gonna be okay, and that the school would survive, and the war looked like it was turning in favor of the Allies. He was sitting in his office, and the porter of the school came in and said, there's a woman and a boy uh, here to see you. So he said, well, show them in. And uh, they sat down, and she, uh, she said to him, what I'm going to ask you now I have no right to ask you. And it is enormously difficult what I'm asking you to do. She says, my son and I are Jewish. And for the last years, we have been fleeing the Nazi terror. All of our family and all of our friends are in the camps or how they have escaped to other countries. And we have come to the end. She says, I am desperately ill and I will not live much longer. And she said, I am asking you to take my son and keep him safe in your school until the war is over. And Burnell thought to himself and he thought, I can't do this. He said, that puts everyone in the school at risk puts all these boys at risk, I can't do this. And we don't have any responsibility to this woman or to her son. I would do it if I could, but I can't. And then he looked at the mother and he looked at the son and he looked at the mother and she was very emaciated. And he looked at the son and he knew what he had to do. So he said, I'll take your son and I will keep him safe will give him a new identity and keep him in the school. And 
I hope and pray that we will be able to keep him safe until this horrible war is over. And with that, the mother went on so she would not be caught. And uh, so it, that would betray the boy. So uh, they took the boy into the school. He was a very bright kid. Uh, he, he did quite well and fit in well. But about six months later, he was up one night and he was reading the one book that his mother had given to him, the one possession he had from his mother. And it was Hebrew scriptures and he was reading them aloud. And one of the cooks heard it and went to the Nazi commandant and turned, turned him in. So the next day the porter comes into the Brunel's office and says to him, uh, the commandant is at the door with the troops in the plaza and they've taken all the kids, uh, the students out onto the front plaza and he's here to arrest you and the boy. And so anyway, Brunel goes out of the, onto the, uh, the plaza there and uh, the commandant says to him, he's in handcuffs for now. The commandant says to the boy, he said, listen well to the lesson of this day. If you do not live under Nazi justice, you will be punished severely. Then he goes to lead Brunel off into the wagon that'll take him to the camp, Mulhausen. And uh, Brunel stops for a moment and he turns toward the students. He said, no, listen to the true lesson of this day. The life which has been lived which does not know what it means to drink deeply of sacrifice for another with no claim upon you. That life has not been lived at all. And he went out, got on the, uh, the wagon and they took him off to Melthausen where he died just as the liberation occurred. This notion that part of our life is the ordinary sacrifice which the innkeeper does. And we can all do that. And we do all do that. But that it is also great sacrifice, which we all do for those we are close to and love. But Francis, Pope Francis is saying here, we must also have that kind of love and willingness to sacrifice for those who are distant from us by all of the criteria that the world thinks of distance. And so uh, a lot of the encyclical focuses then on the questions of how the world breaks down our relationship of love with the stranger and how we must work very hard to overcome it. Uh, the first of these is the moral paralysis of structures. So much evil in the world, so much suffering is caused not by direct human intervention, but through structures, which all of us have, have participated in creating. And all of us can use as a defense and do as a defense mechanism say, was well, not I doing this. But what Pope Francis is pointing to, but it is the structures which decimate our obligations of love and turn us into participants in the evils perpetrated on others in other lands, of other faiths, of other peoples. Uh, the second the Pope deals with is the idea of superiority. The love he's talking about has no superiority to it. No superiority of race, no superiority of economic levels, no superiority of personal pride and superiority. The, the, the Pope asks us to look into our consciences and to build that kind of a social friendship which seeks to eradicate all of those things 
from our even even implicitly from our relationships with others, how we think of others. Uh, and um, the third is the allure of rationalization. Uh, this is one of my um, favorite elements to consider in that uh, we all rationalize things. It's how we get by. With it. Anybody with a conscience gets by. And I remember when I was a kid and I would sometimes want to do something and it would be something I knew wasn't quite the right thing, but I wanted to do it. So, you know, I might talk with my mother about it. And, and uh, so she had this devastating response, which would say, and this is before these wristbands ever came around. What would Jesus do? Well, I didn't always know what Jesus would do, but I knew it was darn well not what I intended to do or wanted to do. And that's where rationalization is. Rationalization is when we convince ourselves that something which on a certain level we know is the right thing, or at least not the best thing, we convince ourselves it's the right thing. And then we use that as the justification. So the Pope, uh, speaks to these, and the final one is that of domination and violence. You know, to what degree do we participate, even indirectly, in structures of domination and violence? So he's saying that all of these structures work against, diminish, impede, and many times destroy the social friendship we are called to have others in very different circumstances in very different places. And it's really hard in the world in which we live to root those things out, even to root them out within our own lives and ways of thinking. Uh, we do it on the conscious levels. Uh, you know, we do a lot of good. We seek our, our, you know, formation of conscience, but all of these things creep in. And what the Pope is saying is, that we should not let any one of these four things, structures or uh, a sense of personal superiority, whether by race or uh, personal superiority, economics or your, your rationalization or a sense of, of domination of different kinds, that should not be allowed to diminish the social friendship we uh, reach out to uh, with others. And um, when I was uh, young, uh, I was a Cub Scout. I grew up south of San Francisco. I was a Cub Scout. And in our Cub Scout troop, our, our, uh, our leader, our den mother, Marion Willen, was a wonderful person. And she'd always take us to do fun projects. We went to the Junior Museum one year for six weeks and learned how to build uh, airplanes that could fly and we could craft them and so forth. And then um, uh, out of balsam and paper, we went learned elementary surfing at the beach. It was, so we did lots of good things. And then Marion came in one day, Mrs. Will came in and uh, said, uh, uh, boys, we've got a new project for this next six weeks. This was in late October. We're going to raise money to buy turkey for men at St. Anthony's Dining Room. Well, St. Anthony's Dining Room, for those of you in any Franciscan network in California probably know, is one of the great works of the Franciscan communities uh, uh, that has been around for probably 60 years. And well, more, I'm, I'm 67, so it's more than 60 years. Uh, and does tremendous work with homeless men and, and now beyond, uh, and homeless women too. Afterwards, the boy, boys got together and we said to Mrs. Willem's son, Jamie, you know, you got to talk her out of this. We, we, don't, we don't want anything to do with this, you know. So she said, no, that she's wedded to it. The other mothers backed her up big time. So for the next four weeks, we had to take our wagons and go from house to house asking people for their uh, excess bottles. In those days, you had a deposit on bottles. And it was not an insignificant amount of money given the day, 
So we collected thousands and thousands of bottles and took them to the uh, stores and redeemed them. And the, 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 the store person that were never happy to see us during that period of time, and we were no happier being there. But we figured, well, we slug it out of it. And then what Marion did was, though, the genius of what she did was, when we collected the money, we were able to buy, I forget how many turkeys for Thanksgiving. Uh, she said, now you're going to bring these turkeys down to St. Anthony's and share a meal with the men. Okay. We did. It, it's in what was and is the toughest and most dangerous part of San Francisco. And so we went there, our mothers went with us and everything, but it was stunning for us as 10 year olds raised in middle-class households to encounter this. And it was transformative. That's why we were going there. The most important part of that whole exercise was not the money we raised for the turkeys. It was that uh, Marion made us go and face and encounter people who were totally outside of our experience or, or realm in any, any way. And so we talked with them and shared their stories uh, and it just was transformative. That's all I can say about it because the world we knew didn't include any of this at least in a personal level. We know there was poverty, but we knew there were people who lived on the streets, but we didn't know it internally. We didn't know it viscerally. We didn't know it affectively. And that's what Pope Francis is really talking about in Fratelli Tutti, that this kind of a, of a social love requires encounter. We must shatter the boundaries imposed on us by rationalization and by structures and all the limitations. And we must encounter directly the plight of those who are distanced from us. And that cannot be done in an abstract way alone. That's the social friendship that uh, Pope Francis is talking about. That was the social friendship that Francis was talking about. St. Francis. And that's what Fratelli Tutti is talking about. For all of us, it's a hard thing to think about to make that real in our lives and to understand in our own lives this multifaceted call of the parable of the Good Samaritan and what it means for us as consolation, as challenge, is as as reinforcement for what we're doing and as a call to change thank you thank you thank you bishop malcolm for that was a wonderful talk about social love and how do we allow various structures to limit us and and, and limit our transformation uh, that's just beautiful um this opportunity is brought to you by the franciscan school of theology development department mm -hmm. Uh, let us please give Bishop Robert McElroy a round of applause. Okay.